Next up, we're going to continue our exploration of care areas, and this one on endocrinology. So in this panel of experts, we're going to discuss things like bone health, growth, which is, includes height and weight, and puberty in Duchenne, um, as well as discuss the latest care recommendations. Helping us lead our discussion today is Kathy Kinnett, PPMD's advisor for care. We also have members of our PPMD's adult advisory committee on each of these panels. So with the first discussion uh, in this care uh, uh, section, we're going to discuss bone health. Um, Dr. Leanne Ward from the University of Ottawa is going to be joined by Adam Weschler. Uh, Duchenne certainly leads to complications with bone health. Uh, steroids can further those complications. And this is going to be a discussion on the uh, areas of care within here, including interventions and monitoring care. Um, and uh, we're going to have a great discussion and then uh, lead to new discussions under endocrinology. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Kathy to lead the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, as you said, there are several issues uh, around endocr uh, several endocrinology issues uh, in Duchenne that are exacerbated by steroids, and one of those is certainly bone health. So uh, we're going to start this session off with Leanne and Adam, and we thought it would be fun to have um, Adam and Leanne uh, present this information rather than me talk. So I'm going to not talk and turn it over to them. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. On behalf of Adam and myself, we'd like to welcome to you to this 15-minute excerpt on bone health in Duchenne. I'd like to start by introducing Adam to you. Adam is a 24-year-old with Duchenne muscular dystrophy living with his family in Vermont. He's currently serving in AmeriCorps as a work readiness trainer for people with disabilities. Adam graduated from the University of Vermont in 2018 with a degree in environmental studies. And here he developed a passion for sustainability and accessibility in the built environment. When he's in his free time, he enjoys reading, playing video games, and spending time with friends. Adam. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Leanne Ward. Uh, she is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa, where she has held a research chair in pediatric bone health since 2010. Recently, Leanne was the chair of the Endocrine and Bone Health Subcommittee for the Centers for Disease Control 2018 DMD Clinical Care Considerations. She has also partnered with PPMD to educate the DMD community about bone health and endocrine issues for the last few years. Well, thank you, Adam, for that kind introduction. First slide, please. So we'd like to start by Adam sharing with you his journey with osteoporosis or bone fragility in the Duchenne context. Adam, could you tell us what it's been like for you to have fractures? Sure. Um, so I was first diagnosed uh, when I was three years old. Uh, my parents noticed that I had difficulty keeping up with other kids my age, and I'd often fall. Um, and so my first fracture actually also happened uh, when I was three, uh, pretty soon after my diagnosis. Um, so I think what happened is I ended up falling off a short climbing structure that was probably only about two or three feet off the ground, um, fracturing uh, my upper arm. And then uh, about a year and a half later, I had my second fracture, um, again, probably falling off a short climbing structure. Um, and this time I broke my right heel. Um, what's significant about these fractures was that both of them were before I started taking steroids. And so I started steroids when I was six years old. And so the following few years, um, from about the time I was 18 until, until 14, had a number of other fractures, um, such as big toe, wrist, ankle, and a finger. But it wasn't until 16 um, that my first major fracture uh, where I ended up breaking my left femur. So at, at that time, I was still pretty new to using my wheelchair. Um, I wasn't very much in the habit of wearing a seatbelt yet. And um, I was at a Boy Scout picnic in a park, and I tried driving my wheelchair over a swale, which is like a ditch in the ground. Uh, it turned out being steeper than I thought it would be. And chair stopped, um, and I fell out and um, ended up breaking my femur. 
was taken to the hospital, got a full leg cast, and um, I stopped walking pretty much after that after that fracture. And then at 17, um, as I was using my uh, wheelchair full time, um, my scoliosis got worse. Um, and by the time I was uh, at this age, uh, I had a 40 degree, c- degree curve in my spine. Um, so we decided it was time for uh, spinal fusion surgery. And in preparation of the surgery uh, to make my bones a little stronger, um, I took two doses of what's of a drug called uh, vimedronate, which is a type of bisphosphonate, uh, to strengthen my bones some. And both of these doses are about four weeks, four to six weeks apart. Uh, they're infusions I had to go to the hospital for, and I stopped taking them about two months before the surgery. And I didn't, uh, for the next three years, I didn't have any more fractures uh, until I was about 20 years old. Um, what happened here is I ended up fracturing both of my femurs, um, because I was trying to drive down a portable ramp in my wheelchair, um, as I was leaving a friend's house at, at college. Um, and the ramp happened to be too short for the number of stairs. So I made the ramp too steep. And, uh, as I was going down the ramp, the wheelchair essentially tipped. I went with it and wheelchair kind of landed on me. Um, and so my dad was picking me up from, from school for the end of the semester. And, um, before sitting me up in my wheelchair, made sure I could, could feel, um, all my fingers and toes. And so once I got set up, I drove my wheelchair into our, uh, wheelchair accessible van and then drove me to the hospital. Um, I don't really remember anything after getting in the car um, because I ended up developing what's called uh, fat embolism syndrome, which Leanne will explain in a few minutes. And because of the the fat embolism, I went into respiratory distress, uh, quickly deteriorated and had to be intubated um, and sent to the ICU. And so this was a very scary time for me and my family. And then finally at 22, um, this is where I am now, I started going to a new clinic um, where they identified the start of compression fractures in my spine. Um, and so I started a new type of bisphosphonate called zoledronic acid, um, which only now requires an infusion once a year. Well, thank you, Adam, very much for that narrative. That's quite an incredible journey that you've had with your fractures. I'd like to ask you a few questions. First of all, what was the most challenging part of this story for you in terms of having fractures? Yeah, I think um, looking back, uh, one of the most difficult parts was having to be aware, I guess, of my surroundings a lot of the time. And I feel like you you have to be, I had to be a lot more careful. as a kid when I was driving around in my wheelchair. Um, And that's often difficult as a kid because you don't always want to be careful all the time. You want to be having fun. Mm -hmm. So you were hesitant to do things because of this fear of fractures. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me what it was like to receive the intravenous medications? What was that experience like for you? Yeah, um, so I tolerated the bisphosphonates quite well. Um, I had maybe only some minor side effects uh, the first couple times I took it, um, so just feeling a little feverish after the pomidronate, and as well as with the zoledronic acid, uh, the first time I took it, felt a little feverish um, and had some digestive issues for about a day. Mm-hmm. And I think an important message here is that it's important that these bone protection medications are given by someone with expertise in their administration so they can help you through those side effects. Absolutely. And my last question for you is what would be the main message today that you want to share with the viewership from your story? Yeah. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of the, the fractures I've had kind of come down to fall prevention, especially in uh, a wheelchair. Um, cause I've found that it's really important to be, be careful and being aware of your surroundings, especially when you're trying to drive over rough terrain. Um, cause it's, 
not necessarily your wheelchairs may not be as stable as you think it is. Um, and, uh, I've found that is important to wear my seatbelt. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we think about osteoporosis, we often talk a lot about monitoring and treatment, which I'm going to do now, but we don't maybe talk enough about fall prevention. So I think your take home message, Adam, is really important. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So what I'd like to do now is just to capitalize on facets of Adam's story that raise important principles about bone health, monitoring and osteoporosis treatment for you. And so the first message is that both the muscle weakness, the myopathy, and steroids contribute to fracture risk. Delayed puberty and growth and nutrition also do as well, but the two main drivers of these fractures that Adam's described are muscle weakness and also steroids. Now, Adam talked about having a fracture of his upper arm at three years of age, well before he started steroids. Three-year-olds should be able to play and fall off small structures and not fracture. The upper arm is an unusual place to a fracture, and so this this was a very important fracture event in Adam's story. We know that boys who are not yet on steroids can have fractures of their spine, and the risk of those spine fractures goes up that much more if they're on steroids, and steroids can also increase the risk of having long bone fractures like femur fractures such as Adam. Next slide. So Adam talked about what it's like to have osteoporosis. I'd like to show you what osteoporosis looks like on x-rays when, when we go through things with families. So on the left, we see pictures of the femurs, and this is in a boy with Duchenne and a boy without Duchenne. This is the biggest bone in the body. And then on the right, we have a picture of a boy with Duchenne at different time points showing the bones in his back called the vertebral bodies. So on the left, in the boy with Duchenne, the first thing we notice is that the femur looks pale compared to the boy without Duchenne. And we know that that means the bone density is low. Certainly low bone density is a predisposing factor for fractures. But you'll also notice that the femur is smaller in size compared to the boy without Duchenne. And that comes about as a result of the subnormal mobility and the lack of weight bearing. And then the arrow is pointing to a little crack in the cortex at the end of the femur. And that's a classic type of fracture that we see in this setting, although fractures can occur anywhere along the length of the femur. And then on the right, we have a boy who's on the left of that right hand panel, eight years of age on steroids for Duchenne, and he has a beautiful spine x-ray and we've started monitoring him. He comes back a year later, he has no back pain, but I notice that he has a vertebral fracture, which you can see there with the red arrow. The bones in the back are normally very square and they get bigger as they go down the spine. And you can see that the bone with the arrow is smaller than the one above. So I know that's a vertebral fracture. And you may say, well, that looks very trivial. And indeed, visually, in the early phases, it does look trivial. But clinically, this is very significant. It means the bones in the back have not been able to withstand the pressure from the upper part of the spine. And this is osteoporosis. The other reason this is so significant is that if left untreated, then this will just progress, and that's called the vertebral fracture cascade. Next slide. Now, Adam talked about a rare but very important complication of osteoporosis called fat embolism syndrome. And this can happen not only after a fracture, but just after a bone injury, a bone bruise, so even just after a fall, and that's very important to understand. So in fat embolism syndrome, we know that the anyone with subnormal mobility and anyone on steroids can have an accumulation of fat cells called adipocytes in the bone marrow within the long bones. And then if there is a bone injury or a fracture, those fat cells can come together in the bloodstream. They're released by the injury and form fat droplets that go to the lungs, shower the lungs and clog them up, making it difficult to breathe. And they can even go to the brain and cause problem with cognition. So this is uh, a rare but important complication of osteoporosis and very important to know that if you have difficulty breathing after a fall or a fracture, you need urgent medical attention. Next slide. And then finally, how do we monitor and treat osteoporosis in Duchenne? And Adam has already alluded to this with his journey. I think the key take home message here is that we start early. We don't start after years. We start around the time of diagnosis or at latest at the time of steroid initiation. 
we start with bone density tests yearly. And then if a patient is on steroids, we do a spine x-ray every one to two years. If they're not on steroids, we do the spine x-ray every two to three years. And we do the spine x-rays even more frequently than that if there is back pain or if there's been a drop in BMD. And then when there's the very earliest signs of osteoporosis, including those subtle changes in the spine that I mentioned, even if there's not back pain, or if there's a single long bone fracture with little trauma, we would recommend therapy. And the bone protection therapy is exactly what Adam talked about, intravenous solidronic acid or intravenous pimidronate given every few months, depending on the stage of treatment of the child or the man. And with this therapy, we are looking to keep back pain at bay and to keep the bones as strong as possible. And you may say, well, why not use oral agents? Because there are oral versions of these medications. And the reason is that the bioavailability of the oral agents is very low. So not much gets into the bloodstream and not much gets into the bone. And we know that IV therapy is more effective in terms of protecting the spine and uh, helping with the bone density. So with that, next slide. On behalf of Adam and myself, we'd like to thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to your questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne and Adam. Adam, that is my favorite slide, is the last one. I'm gonna kick it right back to uh, Ryan and Eric. Thank you so much, Kathy, Leanne, and Adam. And Adam, I love the background uh, of your, your Zoom screen. So as Kathy said, we're, we're going to have questions at the end. Remember, there's a box right below your player. You can start typing in your questions now for the Q&A panel at the end of this. Um, and remember, on all these topics under endocrinology, we have a number of resources on the PPMD site, some easy downloadable materials to take with you for your, you and your physician to have a discussion on some of these topics. And it contains information to, about the latest with the care considerations in terms of endocrinology. So next up, we're gonna be talking about puberty. We are lucky to have Dr. Rob Benjamin from Duke University as well as PAC member Austin LeClaire. Um, puberty should be evaluated each year after the age of nine years old. Um, and st steroids may impact puberty in different ways. Um, and this panel is gonna talk about this. And, and this, is, this is a sensitive topic and, and we really do appreciate Austin uh, from our PAC for uh, uh, taking on this topic with the panel. Uh, and for all the speakers. So with that, I think I'm ready to hand it back over to Kathy to begin this next panel. Thanks, Ryan. As you said, this is a sensitive topic and I really appreciate Robin and Austin um, discussing this. So I'm gonna kick it right, right to Robin Austin. Hi, my name is Austin LeClaire and I'm 21 years old and I'm a patient with Duchenne. Um, I'm currently going to college for mechanical engineering but I'm thinking about using the degree to get into bio um, science. But and I serve as a PAC member, as Ryan mentioned. I also am on the certification certification committee um, for um, hospital locations that we want to certify to be able to treat Duchenne specifically. And I'm also a co-founder of One Rare. So. I, I'm kind of rare in the sense that I personally haven't required any medication to go through puberty. I've been able to do it naturally, and um, I just have always wondered why that was. But I think it's important to know that you don't necessarily need medications to be able to go through puberty. Sometimes you need to do it, but for the most part, I think there's a chance that you could just do it naturally. And I understand that puberty is very uncomfortable to talk about, but I think it's a really important thing because sometimes when it's delayed, it can really set back your life and make it a little more difficult. But I think that it's a really good thing to talk about. And I, I personally was delayed. It, I think it came in around the age of 18. Um, and like, I think the hardest part was, um, yes, mentally, I was an adult and I was 18, but physically it's a lot different because it's hard to tell what those things, what you're going through when you're mentally an adult, because most adults don't naturally, don't really normally have to go through that. So I think I'm going to pass it on to Rob now. 
Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Austin and PPMD and Kathy. Um, I, you know, Austin, you amaze me with your breadth of knowledge on it already, your observations. Um, and this continues to be the case with every young man in Zushan that I, I talk with. So I, I appreciate the chance to talk a little bit about puberty. Um, and I do have some slides to go through. Um, I thought uh, Austin and I have exchanged some emails about some questions um, that he thinks you know uh, people may like to um, to know the answer to. I should my brief introduction is I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Duke, um, and I've been involved with our neuromuscular clinic here, uh, Dr. Smith, and and involved with PPMD for uh, several years now, and, and greatly appreciate the chance to to meet with you all and talk with you all. Um, Austin, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Actually, I have a few questions. Oh, great. So I think one of the important ones is, when is puberty supposed to happen for the average person versus someone with Duchenne? Sure, good question. Um, you know, typically we think that puberty uh, starts anywhere from 9 to 14 in boys. It's a little bit early if it starts at 9, a little bit late if it starts at 14. But usually we think of that broad time range from 9 to 14. And I'll show this in the slide too, but it, it kind of speaks to the variability, right? You know, why do some start puberty at 9 and others later than that? Um, another point that I'll, I'll come to is sort of getting to your question with Duchenne, and, and that's that medications can definitely, uh, particularly steroids, can impact uh, timing and how far puberty goes. So the other question was, how do we know when puberty is happening? Yeah, it's, because it's, like it's obviously varies from each person to person, but what are generally the key signs that you know it's happening? Yeah, good question. And I'll show this in a slide as well. I think, you know, people often attribute puberty to, um, a, you know, body odor and hair uh, mood changes, though those can happen even before puberty starts. And it's, it's hard to know um, when puberty is happening in your own body, um, there are some uh, pretty telltale signs that we look for, uh, namely testicular enlargement in boys. Um, so it is a sensitive topic and one that is awkward, honestly, for patients and families to discuss. Often parents don't know when it's happened, but important to, to have that exam. So I think it's another important thing to talk about is when do you decide that you really need to start thinking about different options? Like if you're not going through puberty fast enough, when should you decide to take hormones and get the shots for it? Yeah, um, another great question. I, I mean, really, there's no um, final uh, determination on age to do this. I think um, in, in most uh, young men, we start at 14. We, we consider if it hasn't started, if I by 14 that will jump in, but certainly everybody's different. And um, I think there are um, some who might think about that a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll go through a few slides that show this maybe makes sense in the interest of time to do that. Um, now, can we go to the next slide? So, you know, what is puberty? Uh, puberty is a transition from sexual immaturity to maturity. It's when a boy becomes a man or a girl becomes a woman. Um, the physical changes are significant um, as puberty begins. You may notice changes in growth in your voice. Um, this can have impact on, on muscle strength and bone development, in addition to every part of your body, including the brain and heart. Next slide. Why, why does puberty or how does it happen? It happens because your brain sends a message to your testicles and your testicles make testosterone and sperm. The exact messages aren't important. I put the letters up, but um, I come back to the slide as we talk about how uh, steroids and testosterone can impact that. Next slide. I bolded testicular enlargement because as, we, as I said before, this is really the sign that it started. All the other things that uh, number one in particular, hair in the private area under the arm with acne and body odor can be uh, associated with the beginnings of puberty, but also can happen before that happens. And then after you get into puberty is when you make uh, the male hormone testosterone and, and um, sperm. Can we go to the next slide? 
as we said, when it usually starts uh, from nine to 14. It used to drive me crazy when girls always told me they were more mature than me when I was nine or 10. But it's true that girls start before boys. They start about two years ahead. So, you, you know, um, because a, a sister, a younger sister has started and you haven't doesn't mean that you're late. And that's an important point. It's on average two years later for boys to start. And boys usually have a longer pubertal time than girls. Next slide, please. Uh, we typically say that puberty is late when it hap uh, when nothing has changed significantly by 14 years of age. And um, you mentioned this, Austin, but you may, you know others may wonder why haven't we noticed this even the late teenage years? And partly it can just be your body. It sounds like your body wasn't ready to do it. Um, there's a wide variety of ages when we hit our growth spurts, for instance, or well, uh, uh, you know when other changes happen. So um, not everybody is supposed to do it at the same time. Uh, but there's another big reason why this might happen in Duchenne. Can you go to the next slide, please? And that's steroids. And I apologize at the outset for misspelling in Plaza. It should be an M. But, uh, uh, you know, steroids can block the brain message. They, that's really their main um, problem uh, with what they do with puberty. So those two, letter, those two um, uh, abbreviations I showed you before get blocked by this high dose of uh, steroids usually, and that can lead to then um, a block in your body going into puberty, testicular enlargement, and sperm production. Next slide. You asked when we start testosterone or when, when to do things, and that's again usually 14, though we may um, attempt to jumpstart puberty before that. What do I mean by jumpstart? We may give a short course of testosterone because we'd always rather that you do it um, and, and not get it through medication. Yes, Austin. Yes, yeah, so I think it's um, really important to also consider, I know one of the main concerns that many parents have is putting their kids through puberty too early or don't want to do it at all because when you're going through that, you can be a pretty big jerk and be really nasty to people. Right. So I think maybe it's also a consideration of how behaviorally, how will it affect their behavior? But obviously that's a natural thing. But I think when you have to do it medically, I think it generally um, aff affects it even worse than normally. No question. Um, you know, I think, uh, as you say, um, you know, that medicines and interventions can have those effects that we don't want. Um, and so, uh, to, and that is part of uh, changes that happen with puberty or mood changes, um, but they can also happen before puberty begins. So moodiness doesn't mean puberty has begun. Anytime you put somebody on uh, medication, um, it, like testosterone, we have to think about those side effects. And again, we want to make sure you can do it um, before we step in to help with it. Um, Jump-starting it and giving a short course um, is, is uh, you know, fine and, and no problem, but, you know, more long-term um, treatment with testosterone is uh, usually we try to wait and see if, um, you, you know, you, your body can do it uh, first. I don't know, you know, why some um, uh, have it as late as they do, but, you know, that's why seeing your doctor regularly and having those exams and those conversations are really important um, early on. Like I said, it's an awkward topic for for um, for patients and for uh, families and for physician, but it's a super important one um, to to have. I think you've asked. You know, my other slides show essentially what you've asked. So I don't know that we have to go through it um, in more detail. But it's just the I think some of the, the take home points are that um, it's important that your body make uh, or you receive testosterone because we know it has important. Um, effects on on bone health in, in particular can also help with muscle strength but you know really um, in, in patients particularly um, young men with Duchenne who are on high doses of steroids this can be an important bone protector um, as Leanne talked about we don't have a lot of um, you know other options for for bone treatment um, and so this is one that if we think you're missing can can be helpful Um, do you have any other questions, Austin? Did I, did I answer? I think uh, the final question was, why do some um, people have normal puberty with Duchenne and some have late puberty and then some don't have puberty at all? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think 
um, the, the, those who typically go through puberty often have a different, uh, you know, a different need for steroids. I think steroids are the common theme. You know, we talk about bone health, and you'll also talk a little bit about growth. Some of those can be impacted by Duchenne without steroids. Puberty probably isn't. Uh, you know, if you if you don't get put on steroids, you probably will go through puberty um, on your own. And so it's really a medication effect as much as anything. That's why I don't always like the term delayed puberty in, um, in Duchenne. I feel like it's blunted um, in, in many um, young men. So probably medication, um, the dose of Enflaza that you're on, and then, as we said, just timing of uh, your own development. Um, probably all of those play into it. Thanks, both of you guys. This, this is such an interesting topic. And Rob, I just have one question. It seems um, when you talk to families that the endocrinologists sometimes are reluctant to start this conversation around puberty and around testosterone. Are there reasons for that? Or do you have an age that this conversation should start? Um, I'm biased, but I think uh, it should start with our first visit um, just to talk about uh, you know what we see. I think it's probably the the awkwardness of that topic. It's a sensitive topic and and an emotional topic. The idea that you know you may not go through this on your own. That's um, you know that can be traumatic for families. So I would imagine that might be one of the things um, uh, preventing that conversation from happening. But I think you know we we try to have that conversation on on day one, even with a um, you know young patient. Um, talk about all, all three things, bone growth and um, uh, testosterone and puberty, because that way um, it, it helps people think about, you know, the future and, and what we can do. I think that some of the issues are come when they are seen in a center that maybe doesn't have an endocrinologist that routinely sees patients. Um, if that happens, is there an age at which parents should um, request that they see an endocrinologist or have that conversation with their neurologist or neuromuscular specialist? Yeah, I'm biased on that answer too, because I feel like we, uh, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think endocrinology has a role uh, a, a, as soon as diagnosis happens. Um, and so I would be in strong favor of having some connection with a pediatric endocrinologist who, who's involved in clinical care um, right after diagnosis, you know, or, or as soon as possible after. If it's, a, if it's a burden for the family to travel, you know, one thing we've, we've learned with our current um, health environment is we can do things remotely. Uh, we can connect with families and through, through um, groups like PPMD, we can make those connections even if we're not there in person. So I would mm -hmm. advocate for that, um, you know, anytime. Do you know if there have been studies that have demonstrated the advantages of testosterone or the uh, impact of testosterone on muscle strength and bone health? Or are those just assumptions? I, I mean, I know they've been a little bit. And in Duchenne? Uh, you know, I know Leanne has more breadth of uh, background and, uh, with that and, and may be able to speak to it. Um, we, maybe we could come to that in the, the Q&A at the end. I, I think um, there, there's still a lot that's unknown, but I think it is uh, pretty clear, pretty established that the testosterone or the absence of testosterone is a is a risk factor for bone problems. Um, so I would I, I would um, you know support that uh, or I think that's supported in in literature. Okay, thanks, thanks both of you. This is really fascinating. I'm going to send it back to Ryan and Eric in the studio. All right, thanks so much, Austin. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was a really, really great discussion. And I think it gives a lot for parents to be able to go and families to be able to go to their care teams and have a discussion about um, what, everything that we talked about over that last panel. Um, and again, the care team at PPMD is at the ready to talk to you prior to those appointments. I think the take home message of having these discussions early on uh, are so critical. And you know, let's face it, some of these issues really do impact the you know, social, emotional health uh, of the people we love with Duchenne. So we should not shy away from them. Um, so our next panel uh, is, is gonna be uh, on height and weight. So we're joined by Dr. Phil Zietler from Children's Hospital of Colorado. Uh, and we also have Colin Wirth from PPMD's PAC joining the conversation. And I'm going to hand it over to you to start this discussion on height and weight. Kathy? 
Thanks so much. Welcome, Phil and Colin. We're so glad that you guys are here to talk about this. This is one of the most discussed topics on social media, so I will turn it over to both of you to enlighten us. Uh, okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, nice to see you, Colin. Colin and I have uh, talked a few times um, uh, in planning for this. Um, and thanks to PPMD for allowing us to chat with you guys. We're, we're going to start with just a couple of slides to just orient folks about sort of typical growth and what, what is generally expected. And the, the, the key for understanding this really is to understand growth charts. And this slide here uh, gives an example of different kinds of growth charts. Um, on the furthest left is a chart that looks at growth between zero and 36 months of life. Um, that's designed for people who are, for babies who are laying down. Um, and then this middle chart here, which happens to be for girls, but the same ones exist for boys, is for two to thir two to uh, to adulthood, um, and this is really designed for um, tracking the growth of people who are standing, individuals who are standing. So it's important to keep in mind uh, that this is really intended for standing height. The way this was done was. Um, a cr uh, collection of heights um, and weights uh, among middle-class white kids in the United States, essentially, um, uh, and then putting together what this looks like cross-sectionally. So this was not the growth of people being followed over time, and it doesn't include the growth of people from various race, racial and ethnic groups. So it's important to keep in mind um, the limitations of those kind of growth charts. Uh, there are longitudinal charts where they, uh, the same people were measured over time, uh, and that allowed um, the generation of growth velocity charts, uh, like you see here on the right. And what you see here is that growth velocity falls during childhood being very rapid at about age two, uh, falls during childhood, and actually reach its lowest point right before growth begins to increase uh, at puberty. So you can see that if that pubertal growth spurt is not normal or it's delayed, like uh, Rob and Austin were just talking, that's going to have an impact on the way in which growth is going to look on other charts. Can we see the next slide? Uh, the other thing we need to talk about quickly is bone age evaluation. This is a, a common part of evaluation, um, and this gives us the ability to look at uh, the skeleton um, and compare it to standards which have been put together uh, of what the skeleton looks like um, and what the growth plates look like in a, an average person of a certain age, and that allows us to track how uh, quickly or slowly um, uh, an individual uh, is growing. And we take that into account when we're uh, looking at uh, growth also. Next slide. Um, this gives an example of that. So here's um, uh, the growth chart of a person uh, who's uh, kind of short, uh, but in fact, they're growing more slowly. They're developing more slowly than typical. So their bone age is delayed, not a 14-year-old, but that is of an 11-year-old. That means that they have the growth potential left of somebody who is 11, not 14, and therefore they're going to be taller than it seems. So the endocrinologist can actually make a prediction uh, about what the final height's going to be. And in many cases, such as in delayed puberty, like you see uh, in boys with Duchenne's, that they may in fact end up taller than it seems because their puberty is delayed. Um, and in this case, this girl's uh, height prediction is appropriate for her uh, for her family. So those are three things important, the growth chart, bone age evaluation, um, and taking into account what the growth potential actually is. I think the next slide has to do with Colin's own story, I believe. Yes. All right, Colin, would you like to tell us about yourself? Hi there. Thank you for, um, I'm glad to be a part of this panel. Um, so um, we're going to talk about two things today, um, the, both um, my height and my weight. Um, so the one thing um, 
I will note is I started um, steroids, um, prednisone at age um, uh, when I was almost 10. And I um, had been on, was on that um, for five, around five years. Um, and I had had issues. Um, um, as you see, my height had started um, to um, go under the um, under the normal curve, and also um, I had gained a lot of weight, and um, and then in um, I had started seeing um, the team out in Cincinnati children and um i ended up switching from prednisone to defazacor and i also um started metformin to to help me to lose weight um well first i'll talk about height and then um phil and i can talk more about the um weight issues. So um, as you see, I was um, around, um, I started growth hormone um, in um, the end of 2010. I was um, almost 16 and uh, I was on it for a year. I stopped in um the beginning of 2012 so uh, my height um it definitely started to um my growth definitely was started to become slower after i started steroids and you see um when i start started growth hormone i was around 145 um centimeters or um, like 57 inches, which was below the like, um, normal stature for someone of my age. And um, but, um, Phil and I had talked about this, but um, as you see, after I was on the growth hormone, or while I was on the growth hormone, it didn't make much of a difference in my height. And Phil and I discussed this, that um, actually after looking back, having done it myself, I don't know if I would have taken the growth hormone because it didn't really make much of a difference. And it was also, I stopped after a year because there was, um, you have to take daily, I had to do daily shots with, growth hormone, so I um, kind of got tired of that, but um, it didn't really make much of a difference. And I think also, um, I mean, being in a wheelchair height is, I mean, not the most important thing. Um, I mean, people don't notice your height. And also, I mean, it's easy. I think it's also kind of practical because someone in a wheelchair and also um being smaller it's easier for caregivers or parents to handle you especially um if you're not ambulatory it's definitely um easier if you're smaller for transferring i don't know um if you want to um say something so yeah, I just want to say that I think it's important, and this is something you and I talked about, and that is that um, lots of times uh, people get very hung up on height, uh, but it's important to keep in mind what the optimal height is for somebody, and that may be something quite different for some for an individual who's in a wheelchair and and requiring um, a lot of physical care than it is for somebody who is uh, otherwise ambulatory. And um, I I think in it, for a for a fifteen year old guy, it's easy to feel like height is really important. But I think your recognition that maybe we need to be very careful about that message um, 
important and whether or not height really is something that we should be pushing uh, very hard. Do you want to, how about, let's talk about your, your weight and, and we only have a couple of minutes, but, but I think it's really important. So tell me, you started metformin um, uh, for insulin resistance and, and to, loss, to cause weight loss. What, what do you think was, you lost a ton of weight, Colin. What, what was the trick? Uh, so um, I think I did. I definitely uh, think the metformin helps, but I mean, I've always been um, very um, watchful over um, my diet, making sure I don't eat um, eat too much, um, avoiding carbs and sugars. Um, just yeah, that's important to make sure you're at a healthy weight. And I know it's hard being someone in a wheelchair not um you're not burning calories but trying to limit your caloric intake i mean i know um i mean it's hard to say don't um i mean people well guys enjoy eating but it's to i mean everything in moderation is okay um and i really um like i've tried to um, avoid especially sugary drinks, um, what we call, or, or saying empty calories, so calories that really um, eat, um, getting a lot of calories from um, something you don't necessarily need. And yeah, it's also um, being. Um, Making sure you're not overweight is good for your overall health, including um, obviously if you're um, it's good on easier on your heart too. So not all, and also it's um, again easier for people to you to be handled as well. So um, since I'm um, of smaller stature and of um, I'm not too heavy. I'm able to do um, transfers without a wire lift. So just um, it's easier all around with good weight. I know it's hard to avoid diets, but or to diet, but it is possible if, um, if you're persistent over it. So I think you've done an, uh, actually an amazing job. I, it's, I, I wish people could see your, um, your chart better. I don't think it's very obvious, but, but Colin managed to bring his body mass index um, down from really quite high um, uh, back into the normal range. Um, I, just the, the issue of metformin, um, uh, it, metformin can be helpful. Um, but I think it's really important for people to understand that this is not a miracle drug. Um, the average weight loss with metformin is on the order of 8 to 10 pounds. So this is not going to make the difference uh, between obesity and non-obesity. Um, however, there is there are data that, that indicate that in people who do make lifestyle changes, metformin can accelerate the amount of weight lost in those people. So it doesn't do it much by itself, but if you are making changes, in general, people will see a greater degree of weight loss with metformin than without it. And then more recently, we, I know that there has been some uh, discussion of the potential role of metformin uh, to uh, promote muscle development and potentially uh, prolong ambulation. I, I, again, uh, metformin is a very safe drug. It's very inexpensive, et cetera. Uh, but um, the effects of it are um, pretty limited um, by, by my view. So this is not magic. Thanks to both of you. The wet form and discussion is one that I'm sure will come up again in the question and answer period, as I'm, as I'm sure you would uh, expect, Rob so, or um, Phil. So thank you so much to both of you. I'm going to turn this back at this time uh, to Ryan and Eric, and then we'll get ready for the uh, Q&A part of the discussion. Ryan? Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Another incredible panel. Um, so as we're getting set up for the Q&A, hopefully you're submitting your questions into the box below the player. 
Uh, this is an easy way to get your uh, questions and comments to now what will have all three of these sessions come together as one. So we can go across and ask questions in a number of the areas that were discussed under endocrinology. Um, looks like the panel is getting ready and we're nearly there. One um, quick plug, uh, we are going to be launching in the coming weeks a, uh, a survey for the community on uh, steroid patient experience. And a lot of that experience is linked to steroids. Um, this is the first time uh, the community has ever really been surveyed about how they think and feel about the use of steroids. This has been standard of care for so long, but we've never done preferences on that. So more to come on that now. I'll hand it back over to Kathy, and she will start the panel uh, on endocrinology Q&A. Thanks so much, Ryan. We have a number of questions, as I'm sure you would all expect. So I'm going to start. Um, with bone health, uh, Austin, you, or no, Adam, I'm sorry, uh, did say that you'd had some side effects when you had your first dose of bisphosphonate. So, Leanne, I know that experts should be giving bisphosphonate. Would you recommend that the first dose is given in the hospital? And what's the side effect profile generally like after the first dose? Mm -hmm. So the side effects are most significant with the first dose, although in my experience treating uh, boys with Duchenne, sometimes after the second and third doses, there can be some side effects as well. The side effect is an acute phase reaction. It's like an inflammatory response to the drug. And so what we see about 12 to 24 hours after giving the first dose intravenously is low-grade fever, aches and pains and often at the site of you know the back where there might have been pain to begin with and that can be really quite unsettling for people to feel that degree of aches and pains and the muscles and the bones and also tummy upset and sometimes vomiting now we give medications to completely shut that down uh, to the best of our ability but certainly this can be quite unsettling i think it's really important for families to know that this might be bumpy with the first infusion Many years ago, we used to admit all the patients on these medications and not just uh, boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy to hospital, <clears throat> but it really was just supportive care that we were giving. And so in the end, we decided to do it as an outpatient. And I think that as long as you have really uh, explained to the patient what to expect and you've given them the appropriate medications to handle those side effects, and importantly, you give them an on-call number to call if they have concerns, then really it goes quite nicely. Two other important things to mention are that, first of all, with fever and vomiting, that can interfere with um, the steroid therapy. They may need more steroids because of adrenal suppression. So sometimes to help the boys feel better uh, when they have these side effects, I'll give them some extra steroid to get them through that period. Sometimes there can be a drop in the calcium in the blood as well. And we don't test for that anymore because it typically doesn't cause problems, but we give extra calcium after the infusion as well. Thanks so much, Leanne. Colin, did you have some thoughts on bone health? Yeah, so I've um, I've had um, experience, I guess, with, with everything, um, with issues um, from being on steroids. Uh, um, in addition to um, height and weight, I've had um, some bone issues as well, and um, also um, testosterone. Um, I can speak to that in a bit too, but um, just with bone health, I've had um, some um, vertebral fractures, and also um, a few years ago, um, I broke my the head of my femur, and um, so one of the things I wanted to say, um, Leanne had mentioned that um, the IV bisphosphonates are better. Um, better absorbed than the oral. Um, I was actually on the oral Fosamax for a while, and um, I think that actually um, was having side effects with um, reflux with that too. But um, and I, uh, but um, I switched over to doing the um, the the. Lap. Uh, the lendronate, and um, that seems um, definitely, uh, even after my first dose, I noticed um, 
dramatic um, improvement in um, my bone density score. So, yeah, I think definitely um, the IV bisphosphonates are um, certainly a better option, as you explained. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Colin. It does seem, Leanne, like some people are, will start with the oral um, bisphosphonates and then move to the IV. Is there, a, th there are thoughts that you have around that or recommendations that you have around that? Mm -hmm. You know, my, my concern with that approach is simply that once you make the decision to start bone protection therapy, it's because you're seeing evidence that the boy or the man with Duchenne has lost bone strength. And so I think you want to move in with something that is you know, more potent. Uh, I, I, we don't have that practice at our institution. And generally, in pediatric osteoporosis conditions, not just steroid-treated Duchenne or steroid-naive Duchenne, but also osteogenesis imperfecta, globally, I think most centers would initiate therapy with intravenous agents. I think one of the questions that comes up is whether after you've really stabilized the osteoporosis and helped with the back pain, like Colin mentioned, and you've treated for many years and things are really nicely stable. The individual has stopped growing, which is a risk factor itself for fractures. Is there a role for oral agents, you know, later on? And I think that's an unanswered question, and it's one that I would be open to. I think uh, at our center, we do once yearly zoledronic acid, like Adam talked about. But that is a question that people ask me. What about oral agents once things are stable uh, later on after someone has finished growing? And that's an unanswered question at this point in time. Thanks so much. There are so many unanswered questions, aren't there? So many things we're trying to discover. Um, Rob, one of the questions that comes up is how long do boys necessarily need to be on testosterone? Is this a lifelong uh, drug or is there a point at which is, it can be stopped? A good question. Um, I think, you know, the human body makes testosterone for most of our life. So um, it, if you commit to starting it, um, and there's, you know, no change in therapy. Um, you're still on those high doses of steroids and you've, you've decided that it doesn't look like the body can make it on its own. Then, yeah, I think you're on it um, for good. If, um, if there's a steroid change, and, and I know a lot of research is being done to look at better steroids, steroids that could give you some of the benefit um, that we obviously want to see uh, without those side effects and costs. Uh, you know, so if something changes um, in therapy or you, you change dosing regimens, then there's no harm in challenging the body by stopping it and seeing if you're able to do it. You just have to give it some time because your body will not be used to you know, having to do it if you've been receiving a medicine for it. Thanks. Um, in addition to puberty, is there an advantage of growth with, with testosterone or would you expect to gain height like you would during normal puberty with testosterone? It sort of depends on how you're growing before you started, I think. If um, you know, steroids have such a whopping effect on growth, um, that I, my experience has not been that testosterone turns that around very much. Um, and it's, uh, it's again, just because of that, that strong impact that steroids have on the bone, I haven't noticed a big turnaround. That's, I'm always optimistic for that. Um, you know, we do start slowly and, and progress slowly with, um, testosterone therapy, but we pay close attention to height, um, you know, after starting it. And I, I haven't noticed uh, much growth improvement in, in most young men starting testosterone. Thanks. Um, Phil, are, there are a lot of questions about growth hormone that are coming in. So are there, is there a time that you would start growth hormone or an adv advantage to starting growth hormone earlier, or should it be done in conjunction with testosterone, or what are your thoughts around that? So in general, uh, the earlier growth hormone is started, the, the, the better the outcome's gonna be. Now, most of that is work that's been done in, in other situations. And, and as the theme of this whole hour has been, steroids are a problem. Um, and whether or not starting uh, earlier will really make a huge difference in the setting of high dose steroids, I, I, I think that's 
somewhat unclear, but I would say in general, the earlier you start, the more opportunity there is to have an impact of, uh, of growth hormone. Uh, I, I think one key question or one key point though, is if, if it's not making a difference, um, consideration should be given to, to stopping it. So it might be reasonable to start it early, see if it's going to have any impact at all. Uh, but then uh, the downside of starting early would be um, uh, just being on it for a really long time and having no impact, and that's expensive and burdensome. Uh, so I think if you do start early, you'd want to say, okay, we'll use it for X period of time, and if we don't see a difference, we're just going to stop. So what would your definition of early be, or would that be unique to each individual? And also, how long would you recommend that, that it's uh, it's given before it's reevaluated? Yeah. Well, it's going to be somewhat individual, but I would say as soon as you start seeing uh, growth deceleration would be the optimal time to do it, because if you can prevent the growth, the height deficit um, uh, early on, that that might um, be better in the long run rather than trying to recover from um, a, a deficit that's already established. And then as far as how long, probably nine to 12 months on the outside. Um, if you're not seeing anything at that point, you're, you're not going to see much. Okay, thanks. Leanne, are there impacts of growth hormone on the bones that uh, we should be aware of? So no one's actually looked at that formally in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and even testosterone and its effect on bone is unclear. So we know that outside of the Duchenne setting, that both growth hormone and testosterone uh, exert a positive effect on bone mineral accrual via muscle. So the big question mark in this setting where you have a myopathy is whether that same growth hormone, testosterone, muscle bone positive effect will be there because of the underlying muscle condition. No one has done studies where they've given half of uh, boys on steroids with Duchenne testosterone or growth hormone and not the other half, and then looked at how those kinds of outcomes evolve in terms of growth and effect on bone density. So frankly, we, we really don't know at this point. We do know that most boys with Duchenne make adequate amounts of growth hormone and that it's really the effect of the steroids largely directly on the growth plate. It's very hard to uh, give enough growth hormone to override those effects of steroids on the growth plate to optimize growth in this setting. Thanks. Um, Phil, we, uh, had some, we've had a lot of questions about diet and um, some centers recommend specific diets, low glycemic index diets, other diets. Are, is there anything that you would recommend that uh, has been helpful for these patients? Anything Duchenne specific? I haven't found anything, but I wondered what you're, what you have found. So it's, you know, I think diets are like cold medicine. If there was a good one, there'd only be one, um, right? So the reason there's so many different diets is because there isn't a magic diet. Um, the fact is that the best diet is the one that a person that fits with the person's lifestyle, that fits with their preferences, that that's something they're going to stick with. So um, it, it is true that a lot of people end up eating, I just eat too many carbohydrates naturally. So cutting carbohydrates can be very effective. It's very concrete. That can be useful. But there's nothing magical about the carbohydrates. That's just it just tends to fit easier in people's uh, lives and their dietary patterns. So whatever somebody's going to be able to stick to is going to be the most effective kind of diet. There, there's no science that suggests one is otherwise better than others. Thanks so much. And I guess now that we've all gained the COVID-15, we'll have to all come to you with your diet recommendations. So <laughs> uh, with that, I'd like to thank the panel. This has been really fascinating. I appreciate everyone's input and your participation.